All right, well, welcome. My name's Joe Bojo. I'm with Cap Gemini, and let me welcome you to our September What's Now San Francisco. Uh, I see a lot of new faces. We've been doing this for quite a while, so you eventually kind of get to know a lot of the, the community that comes out for these. So uh, thank, you, thank you to those who have come back. And just out of curiosity, how many first timers do we have? Solid. A lot of it, we have one employee who's in a first timer here, too. So uh, for a maiden voyage here. So uh, let me just give you a, a little bit of context on who Cap Gemini is and what this place is all about. I'm not going to go into detail. We got a handful of members of our, our organization here after the event. Love to chat with you in more detail. But Cap Gemini is a, a French based consultancy, just under 200,000 employees. We consult on a you know, whole handful of different things. and. You're in an asset we have called the Applied Innovation Exchange. There's a map behind you right over there. We have 12 of these around the world. This is uh, our, our most significant here in the Valley. This is our platform in, in Silicon Valley. And what we do here is host clients from around the world to help them navigate and confront their most significant business challenges and business problems. And the way that we do that is applying innovation through exchange. So exchange really kind of relates to what we're doing here tonight. So Often when big companies have problems, they're problems that they've never seen before. There is no obvious answer or solution to. So we have to facilitate what we call an exchange, a discovery of, of the subject matter. And in order to do that, we need to have cultivated a community of domain leaders and experts in, in technology and business and policy and academia, and to know when and how to appropriately leverage that that community and exchange. So tonight we'll exchange, we'll get some amazing subject matter and we'll connect and, and talk uh, about that subject matter together. Uh, the other half of what we do is the word applied. So big companies today have a, have a really hard time navigating the, the complexities of competing with the, the startups and the disruptors that are out there. So we help them to navigate that, that community. And the, the history of what's now is, is really quite endearing and interesting to, to us and to me is that when we were first entering into this region, we didn't have a, a, a foothold really from a brand perspective. We didn't have you know broad reach. And we started to connect and exchange with people that we knew from, from our organization. We were fortunate enough to meet Pete, who you'll I'll introduce here in a second, uh, who leads reInvent and is incredibly well connected in the area and you know a rich history with you know, this exact community in Wired and we conceived of this idea of what, what if we could bring in real thought leaders to talk about what's going on right now and at the cutting edge, and we could exchange within this community, and, and hence we have, uh, here we are tonight. So uh, with that, thank you again. Look forward to talking to you all after the event. I'm going to hand it over to Pete Layden to uh, handle it for the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And thanks, Cap Gemini. Um, we also have Lanny. Here, Lanny Cohen, who's basically the chief innovation officer here for the whole global company. One thing I would say, I was able to, um, over the vacation, we took a little break. As you know, we didn't have the August. I took a little break, went to Europe, and as I was over there, I did pop my head into Capgemini headquarters in Paris. And just so you know, they're, they have a building that when you open the meeting doors open, there's the Arc de Triomphe right there. They're right on the edge of the whole kind of square there. It's just quite remarkable, beautiful place. But it's one thing when you think about this, is we are live streaming this. Um, in fact, you got hashtags here if you want to refer to it, and you can always find the, uh, the, uh, the stream right there. But these things actually go to all kinds of different places all over the world. You mentioned that map back there, all these different applied innovation exchanges. And this is a global organization. It's getting these ideas out, and we really, really uh, appreciate how they've catalyzed the network here and this programming that we've figured out here, as well as getting these ideas out to broad audiences. So thank you so much. Now. There is a famous uh, saying by the 20th century uh, economist Paul Samuelson that the uh, field of economics progresses one funeral at a time. Um, and it essentially, what he means by that obviously is that uh, the field of economics, like a lot of kind of scientific areas, uh, are dominated by the, the old guard that dominates the field really has to die off to actually get the next generation to come up with really fresh new ideas, new perspectives, and really to kind of reinvent that field. Um, and I think about that phrase when I think about our speaker tonight, uh, Mariana Mazzucato. Now, she is, without question, one of the next, up in the, the next generation of really big 
economists who are actually trying to fundamentally rethink the field of economics and really drive in new ideas. Uh, she um, is also someone who's grappling with economic issues that are of real concern to the community here in the Bay Area, the tech community, the business community, particularly around the ideas of what really drives innovation. That's been where her focus is at. We were extremely lucky that she's in town from her base in London, where she's an economics professor at University College London. She's also the founder and the uh, director of the relatively new Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. And she's also uh, talking about a new book that she's just come out with, which we'll talk about in a second here, The Value of Everything. Now, um, this idea, though, back to that quote, it's really since the 70s, the field of economics has been kind of dominated by a kind of a, a way of understanding the market economy that prioritizes the value of capital as opposed to the value of uh, labor. And the business world has kind of morphed around this kind of framework of economics to essentially lionize the, uh, or to actually always try to maximize shareholder value as the main driver of what really drives businesses. And this kind of, over the last several decades, has just gotten to the point where people at the top of the economy, the top of society, have actually been extremely enriched through this kind of prioritization. Uh, and it's actually led to really, uh, really imbalances and inequality and to the point where we're really seeing some kind of political backlashes and all kinds of things that are happening all over the world right now. And so there is essentially um, this issue there. That, now, the tech world, when they were essentially just a small little industry, you could say, they were just part of this larger system, playing by the rules that were already established by the big boys outside of them. But what's happened in recent decade here, as we well know, is the tech world is now, the tech companies are now at the commanding heights of the entire global economy. And so you actually have a situation now where these companies um, are extremely powerful and extremely valuable now and extremely and getting extremely profitable you could say now these are run by com by folks that essentially can uh, come to the mission of essentially what they're trying to do with that idea that they want to really do change the world and they actually have values if you really get in there and we know them and I know folks of these a lot of people running these companies in this tech world are essentially they're trying to do the right thing in many respects they want to deal with climate change better they want to figure out better ways to maybe move wealth around the uh, through the economy, uh, they're, they're very open-minded about how we can change things. And I think there's an opportunity here in the coming decade or so where we could really start to really fundamentally rethink economics and really start to think about an economics that works better for everybody over the long haul. Now, that's a debatable discussion. We can kind of talk about that a little bit later. But in this case, Mariana's new book is a really great place to start thinking about this. Because this book, her book here is The Value of Everything. Making and Taking in the Global Economy. And what she's really getting at there is what really creates value in the economy and where is it the places that people are just extracting value, not really contributing, not really making it, but extracting it. And so from her analysis, which she'll get into in a minute here, um, you know, for example, the financial industry is taking, taking more, way more extraction than value creation. Even though, and they're much more takers than makers in many respects, at least for a lot of the, what they're doing here, despite all the chest thumping of all the wealth creation that they talk about. Uh, the tech world is a little bit more complicated, a little bit more nuanced. There is some great value that's being created by the tech world, no doubt about it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some of that value is being created is built on value adds that, in fact, the government, federal government, through a taxpayers, all of us, has actually been investing in fundamental research that has benefited and laid the groundwork for these tech companies, developing fundamentally new technologies that have been incorporated in, into these new technologies, these new business models. Uh, and also all of us as consumers of platforms like Facebook and Google and others, we're contributing content and we're also opening up our data that can then essentially get uh, monetized by these companies uh, through advertising and, and the like. Yet it's the founders, the shareholders uh, or, and the venture capital and the people that have actually financed these companies that have inordinate kind of returns off of uh, these investments they've made. And it really hasn't, is, is, is reaching this kind of point where we have to maybe start re fundamentally rethinking this. Mariana has actually been thinking about this. She has some provocative ideas to talk about on that. And we're going to actually have a conversation a little bit later with all of you about some of the ways that we might rethink how our, our ideas about big data 
who owns that data, how that data, the, the value generated from that data could actually be move around the society differently. But before we get to that, she's going to actually talk a little bit about the foundations of what her book is about and some of the core ideas I think will lay the groundwork for our discussion coming up. So with that, I think what we want to do is introduce Mariana to come up here and lay out her ideas. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Great. You can just start that. Okay. Ooh, wow, that's loud. Um, so what I'd like to do is basically go through, I don't want to say 300 years of economic history because we have 30 minutes, and, um, but basically argue that the problem is not so much value extraction. That has been occurring for many years, in fact, hundreds of years. Just think of the landlords in the 1700s extracting through what Adam Smith called robbery um, in terms of extracting the land and charging very high prices. That's not new. What's new, and in some ways, it's especially in this part of the world, is that lots of value extraction actually occurs in the name of value creation, in the name of innovation. Um, and this is just as true in the financial world, in the tech world, in the pharmaceutical world. And then you have the opposite case in some other parts of the economy. I'll argue that government, which doesn't actually really understand its role in co-creating value because it's actually bought into the ideology, then you get a self-fulfilling prophecy that actually is then less able to create that value. So I've sort of given you the, the, the how do you say, one sentence summary of what I'll talk about, but it's, I wanted to say that because, you know, value extraction and speculation, they're such strong words. And really getting to the heart of what is the problem when we confuse value extraction with value creation is what I want to talk about. And I should also say that the subtitle of the book is not makers versus takers. It's making versus, is it versus? And taking. It's a verb, right? Which basically means we can change things. Markets are outcomes. They're outcomes of the interactions between different types of actors in the economy, of business actors, different types of businesses, small, medium, and large, uh, different types of public actors from the BBC, very important in terms of value creation in the UK, as well as departments, right, of health and energy. Um, increasingly, the third sector, so charities um, and nonprofits in areas like health and energy are incredibly important. Trade unions have been very important in you know, creating and shaping markets. Um, we wouldn't have the, the uh, well, we wouldn't have weekends, we wouldn't have the eight hour workday without trade unions fighting for that. And those kinds of movements and fights actually help to shape markets. Karl Polanyi, by the way, was a great uh, thinker around this, about markets being outcomes and absolutely co-created and co-shaped by all these different actors, as opposed to thinking that markets are sort of out there and, for example, policies just fixing the problems. Anyway, so what I want to do is sort of start with this great quote, uh, Fred, I did put it up, by Big Bill Haywood, uh, one of the first uh, industrial trade unionists uh, in the United States, who said something that I think really rings very today, right? Especially after the financial crisis and also the anger that many people feel with how little change there has actually been. And of course, we're actually uh, today or this week is celebrating or not celebrating, remembering 10 years since the financial crisis and asking you know, how much has actually changed. And this quote, the barbarous gold barons, they did not find the gold, they did not mine the gold, they did not mill the gold, but by some weird magic, alchemy, uh, all the gold belonged to them, belongs to them, right? So just think of sort of the same thing that's often told or said about the financial sector. My God, huge amounts of profits being made in companies like Goldman Sachs, but what do they exactly do? And is it actually proportional to you know, these returns, actually proportional to the kinds of uh, contributions they're actually making to production? And, oops, that went too fast. And in fact, if you look at the history of economics, this kind of question of who's producing and who's taking, this production boundary, productive sectors, oh, this is what happens when you transform a PowerPoint into this cool thing that you guys, mm -hmm. you say, what's it called? Keep, <laughs> becomes fuzzy. Uh, productive sectors versus unproductive sectors. This idea of also, you know, do we know? I mean, obviously it depends on how we define productivity, how we define value, how we then calculate those in terms of who we would actually put inside this fence and who we would put outside. But what's quite st striking here in this diagram is at least there's a fence, right? And that fence can be contested we can actually have debates. So I'll, I'll give you a bit of history in just a minute, but you know, were merchants in here or there? Were farmers here or there? Were the landlords actually helping farm labor or just extracting labor, right? So these debates 
Um, and the fights, in fact, between also economists in terms of how, how they were thinking about these ideas kind of is represented here by the fence. But what happens when we don't debate value and we just kind of assume it and allow all sorts of self-proclamations to occur, like Lloyd Blankfein's incredible quote, one year after the financial crisis, just one year, what was it, 2009, Goldman Sachs workers are the most productive. Sorry, I feel like I'm standing in front of the slides because everyone's going like that, but they told me to stand here. Um, the Goldman Sachs workers are the most productive in the world. You know, how, how you know, really? Um, or, you know, the wealth creators in Silicon Valley. I'm sure you guys have all, or some of you have, you know, maybe used that word yourselves and talked about how important that wealth creation is. Um, in now that we have Brexit, well, hopefully not, to be honest, it's such a mess, I don't think they're actually gonna do it, not because they decide that it's a stupid idea, which it is, but they're not gonna be able to manage the process. In fact, there's four consulting companies managing Brexit, talk about value extraction. Um, anyway, in the whole Brexit debate, this whole notion of uh, we have to ring fence, however, these really valuable sources of income and wealth in the UK, otherwise we're really gonna go downhill, financial services being seen as still incredibly valuable in the UK, um, and then, my God, a pharmaceutical industry is constantly using this word. Um, in fact, uh, just two days ago, you probably heard or read that the CEO of um, Nostrum Pharmaceuticals increased the price of an antibiotic drug by 400% overnight and then justified it, saying we actually have a moral imperative to... Um, to basically charge the highest prices we can in pharmaceuticals in order to bring back a return to our shareholders, right? So because, you know, we, we are creating value for them. Anyway, so this word is constantly being used. But if this fence is disappearing, in other words, we actually don't even know what this is because we don't really talk about value creation, value extraction. We just assume it and allow these self-proclamations to happen. We're in trouble. Um, and the state, I'll argue in just a minute, is actually in some ways the opposite. We just don't hear that word. I mean, have you ever heard of the state or some sort of state agency as being wealth creating? Probably not. You hear about different types of public actors at best as facilitating, de-risking, a word I cannot stand and I'll tell you why later, enabling, or if you're an economist, is anyone an economist here? Okay, so I have to be careful. Um, and, you know, fixing market failures and things like that. Anyway, so you know, at best the state is redistributing wealth. Anyway, so these are all things that probably shouldn't be so, you know, surprising to you. You hear these all the time, but I want to argue that these are basically just stories, okay? There's, there are narratives, there are discourse. There's also economics, by the way, I'm sure you know this, is a social science. It's not a natural science. We're not talking about molecules and atoms. There's no sort of hardcore theory. It's a social science, which of course can be debated, but if the stories that we're telling about wealth creation are actually kind of uh, built on, I don't want to say thin air, but based on these self-proclamations, we're in trouble. And Plato, smart guy, he said, storytellers rule the world, and could it be that perhaps this whole problem of the 1%, 99%, and you know what I'm talking about, actually traces itself to some of these stories that are being told. The, these stories are actually, in fact, key drivers of that inequality. So we can't just talk about fairness and, you know, uh, redistributing income, we have to better understand how some of these stories about wealth creation are actually underpinning the mechanisms through which some of these really regressive policies, for example, that have also increased inequality, those policies that Piketty talks about in his great book on inequality, have actually come about through storytelling through uh, uh, um, about uh, value. I'll give you some examples. Anyway, so just really quickly, I probably should not have written three whole chapters on economic history because, you know, with Kindle, you can actually tell how much people read of a book. And apparently, Piketty's fantastic book, 6% um, is what people read <laughs> because it was so wonderfully great but very deep. And I must say, this part of the book tried to keep it kind of simple, but it is... Uh, quite long in terms of going through 400 years of economic history. And if anything, you realize, my God, Trump has brought us back 400 years. Why? Because there have been different ways um, in which people have tried to, in economic um, theory, to think about value and this whole issue of the production boundary, where does value come from? And I'll just give you this sort of quick synopsis, especially to tell you that then a huge revolution happened here. And if you don't study history of economic thought, which unfortunately students today are not taught, and if they are, it's like really, really quickly just so you can get to the real hardcore neoclassical economics, 
um, then you don't actually realize just what a big change this was. So what am I talking about? Now, it's not surprising that in the 1600s, which was a period of big international trade, the mercantilists, just think of the Navigation Acts of 1651, put a lot of emphasis on value actually happening through exchange. So they really cared about terms of trade. Um, they cared about the NAFTA kind of deals and how that might be actually screwing over one part of the population over another, so they needed to get the prices right, whether it was about obsessing about exchange rates or trade. And in some ways, the big departure, though, then happens here with the physiocrats in the agricultural period in the 1700s, because unlike the mercantilists, they started to do what later the classicals did, was that, which was actually to position their understanding of value on production, on actually objective conditions, not just trade and prices and exchange rates. Um, and so it's not surprising, right? So this was an agricultural time, and they really believed that farm labor was actually you know, the key source of within that production boundary. That's where value occurred, and they were extremely concerned with reproduction of the system. So to make sure that the revenues that were actually being earned from farm labor weren't siphoned out of the system. Um, I think I have a, 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 a pic, do I? Yes, it's coming. Um, they had the first spreadsheet ever, here it is. Um, so in 1700, amazing, uh, this was the Tableau Economique from uh, Francois Canet. And what he was concerned with, in fact, all the physiocrats were, was to make sure that the productive class, what they were actually producing, the farmers, was not then siphoned off too much outside from the sterile class, the landlords, but also the merchant class, the proprietors, had to you know, sort of remain uh, efficient and make sure that merchants and the trade that the mercantilists had been worried about so much wasn't actually taking up too much of the material. So they did these really uh, high level, if you want, calculations, and their main concern was to make sure that you didn't get what we have today, <laughs> which is a huge amount of hoarding, right? In the US, we have over $2 trillion being hoarded. And I'll also talk about another huge problem related to that in a minute, which is financialization. Anyway, farming and farm labor to them was the source of value. Later, uh, with the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and Karl Marx, we call them the classical economists, not to be confused with the neoclassical economists, focused on uh, labor, industrial labor as being key. And if you read Wealth of Nations, which I'm sure you all have, I'm sure they wouldn't have hired you in your great tech jobs if, they, mm. if you hadn't read Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and especially Karl Marx, which you should, by the way. He basically, all he talked about was innovation. Um, that's, this is why uh, Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations spent so much time talking about the division of labor. They really cared about production, understanding how both technology, so machinery, but also how you organize the factory or any sort of you know, production today affected productivity because productivity was seen as being the key source of growth. Today, we would still argue that's true. And he had this wonderful example of the pin factory comparing when one person had to produce the whole pin to when that uh, production of the pin was divided over 100 different jobs and everyone could do it sort of much quicker because of specialization, et cetera. And increasing returns to scale, learning economies, absolute advantage not comparative advantage, that was just for the one economist in the room. Everyone else can ignore it. Anyway, so they really focused on these objective conditions, whether it's farm labor in the 1700s or industrial labor and everything around it, right? This wasn't a deterministic understanding. Um, uh, the classicals um, in Adam Smith, he was actually quite funny. He was a bit deterministic. It's quite funny because Marx gets such a bad rap often, uh, but Marx was much more dynamic than, than Adam Smith. Adam Smith actually literally made a list he made a list of those uh, jobs that he thought were productive, which were basically, had, again, all had to do with farm, uh, sorry, factory labor. And then he made this incredible list, which is basically everyone in this room um, was unproductive. So priests, any priests here? No. Lawyers, I'm sure there's, if there's no lawyers here, this is incredible. Because there's this whole joke about, well, I won't tell you. Uh, anyway, lawyers, doctors, men of letters, that's me, professor. Um, players, buffoons, musicians, and then he obviously hated the opera. Because, no, no, it's like amazing, right? Opera singers and opera dancers. I mean, you, it's like you wonder where, what he had just seen when he wrote this. Um, whereas Marx was much more uh, nuanced. It kind of, you know, so if he was looking at, you know, someone who's driving a truck, um, where are they driving to? That will depend on whether they're productive or unproductive. And Marx, again, like the uh, uh, physiocrats, was very interested in the reproduction of the system. So in his analysis, you probably read at least a bit of Marx, um, he really believed that it was ex by exploiting labor 
that prophets actually came about. And so his big concern was exactly what everyone's talking about today. When you have the robots or mechanization in his words, what is actually going to happen to the system in terms of if robots or you know, machines are taking over uh, labor and increasing capital labor ratio, what's that going to actually do to the ability of the system to reproduce itself given that the system is based on exploiting labor. That's a bit different from what we're talking about today, but the big question today of what's going to happen when the robots take jobs, when this robotization of the economy is also producing fewer skills in the labor force, lower ability to actually adapt to these big changes. By the way, David Ricardo, already in 1821, in Principles of the Political Economy, was um, writing about this problem. Uh, he wrote a chapter called On Machinery, I can't believe I remember this, chapter 31 <laughs> of Principle of Political Economy, um, where he basically said, we're in trouble. These machines are taking jobs. Then what you had for 200 years was, yes, that's true. Machines did take jobs. It's nothing new today that robots are taking jobs. Uh, machines were taking jobs, but as long as profits were reinvested, right? Machines A take over this amount of labor, but then the profits being earned here are reinvested in another part of the economy, new jobs flourished, right? New skills also were formed. When that stops, and I'll come to this in a minute, I'll call this financialization, when you have a lack of reinvestment of profits in the economy, that's when you get a huge problem. That's actually when the jobs problem arises, but that's different from saying it's the robots. Anyway, just to say they really, really worried about that whole question. Um, and in this analysis, precisely because they actually made this list, again, in Marx it was much more dynamic, then um, you know, they also had to uh, quite explicitly think about, well, what is value extraction? And it came down to, again, if you want an objective understanding of you know, someone perhaps charging <laughs> for something without actually producing much, literally think of a troll under a, a bridge who's charging just across the bridge, so that would be sort of the landlord situation, or, um, you know, how do you say, uh, extracting from the system that they were operating in much more than they were actually doing. So a disproportion between, if you, you know, in using modern parlance, risks and returns. Um, and in this case, why this is so important is that unlike in modern economics where rents are seen as basically these transient, temporary um, states which are due to some sort of monopolistic power, so a deviation from what's considered to be a competitive price, which can be then competed away by removing different types of barriers. For the classicals, rent was basically unearned income, doing something, well, actually doing very little, and yet earning a lot of income, right? So unearned income. Um, and Adam Smith was so, how do you say, even more extreme than that, saying rent is robbery, rent is actually theft. So reap where they never sowed, exactly kind of big Bill Haywood's point. Um, and what I want to argue is that then what happens, and I'm, I'm going to, I didn't, I actually had about five different slides in neoclassical theory, and I thought, forget it, I'm just going to give you the kind of quickie, because what I really want to talk to you about is what happens in terms of the implications of this big change, is that last, uh, you know, list I had up there, which was the big change from the classicals, the neoclassicals, they basically completely reversed the uh, uh, causation. Instead of having theories of value, Right? whether it was farm labor or industrial labor, it was still tied to objective conditions, tied to trying to think, whether they were right or wrong, forget it, but the process of even trying to distinguish what's productive, what's unproductive. Theories of value that also then turned into their understanding of prices, the logic that then occurred under neoclassical economics, which put all the emphasis on preferences, supply and demand curves, marginal utility curves, individuals, whether they are uh, in factories, sorry, you know, managers or laborers maximizing their decisions on whether to work or not, right? So wages in neoclassical theory are based on your preferences for work versus leisure. This idea that it's actually prices which are revealing preferences, which are revealing value, right? This is basically, I just assume most of you know the whole kind of you know, supply and demand curves, you get the equilibrium price, and the prices are actually revealing the value even of wages, that completely changed the logic, right? So instead of having a theory of value that determines the theory of price, you had theories of price determining what's valuable. And what I want to argue is that what this ends up doing, this subjectification of value, 
so focusing on preferences, individual choices versus an objective analysis of production, basically made that production boundary disappear and then facilitated what I mentioned in the beginning, was, which is this ability, so it didn't cause, but it facilitated the ability of value extraction to pass for value creation. And what I want to do with the rest of my time is to talk about the implications of that for huge things, for how we measure output, you know, GDP, for how we think about government, which I already mentioned before, for how we think about prices in you know, areas that are as essential as medicines, for how we thought about the financial sector and how we currently are thinking about platform capitalism and the big challenges for the tech community. And I actually wanted to spend most of that discussion, as we talked about before, Peter, um, around platform capitalism and the future of the digital economy with the Q&A, so we can all sort of reflect on the uh, implications of this for this part of the world. But basically what I want to argue is that when we no longer have, again, a focus on production itself, changes in the division of labor, changes in production, and we have a change from a objective to a subjective analysis, we then allow these kind of statements to be made with a straight face, right? Because if we're actually measuring value by prices, then if you have a very high salary, well, then you must be very valuable. That's why my brother always says to me, if you're so smart, you know, if you're so smart, why the hell are you not earning, you know, millions? <laughs> um, anyway, so the first, <laughs> the first, GDP. Now, part of this problem is a problem that I think, you know, quite a few people know, so even when I uh, teach macro, at least when, when I used to teach macro when I was a still a PhD student trying to make some money, Macro 101, it, it'd be really fun to tell students, do you realize that if you marry your cleaner, GDP goes down, right? Which, you know, why is that? Well, your cleaner, you were hopefully paying him or her, and then you marry him or her, you're, you know, they might still be cleaning, but you're not paying them, so GDP will go down, right? Because we're only including in GDP those items that have prices. We're not actually making value judgments. Um, same thing with pollution. If we pollute GDP, what happens to GDP? It goes up, right? Because you've got to clean it. So there's a price that's actually paid uh, that you pay to clean if you're paying people who are cleaning it, and that will increase GDP, whereas actually that negative effect doesn't. Now, that's pretty well known. What's not well known and is more of an implication of what I was talking about in terms of value extraction um, is that... Well, in fact, I'll just tell you quickly the history behind this, that some areas, like finance, you know, hedge funds, credit default swaps, um, all sorts of quick trades, are they creating value or not? So up until the 1970s, most of the financial sector was not even included in GDP. Um, so for the same reason that social security payments still don't go in, because they're literally just moving money around, right? There's money here and then it gets redistributed there. You're not going to add it. You know, it's not going to be included in GDP because GDP, think of how national income and product accounts are done. We're only including new uh, products and services that, again, have prices to them. Uh, so you wouldn't include just a transfer, right? So finance, most of the financial sector was basically seen like that, just moving money around. And so the only type of finance that was going into GDP was services in the financial sector that charged fees because they had a price. Right, because what you know, we determine value based on things that have prices. So, if you went to a mortgage provider and they charged you a fee to get your mortgage, you would, um, you know, it, that would increase GDP. But net interest payments—the difference between what banks were earning in interest and what they were paying out in interest—hadn't been until then included because it was seen again as just a transfer, basically as rent. Right, rent is just a transfer, um, and so. The problem is, and I have some data there from Andy Haldane, who's the chief economist, he's a very, very smart guy, at the Bank of England, they started realizing the guys, mainly guys, who were at the UN uh, looking at the national accounts, the SNA group, uh, Standard National Accounts, I think it's called, um, that, you know, we have a problem here. There's this huge thing in the economy called finance, um, and, it's, and it's much greater than what we have been accounting for, so we better, you know, what should we do? And instead of saying, what is it? <laughs> you know, should we actually include it in GDP? Is it creating value or not? The idea was basically, we better give it a name. These net interest payments, let's give it a name. So what did they give it, you know, what name did they give it? For the commercial banks, they called it financial intermediation. And for the uh, investment banks, they called it risk taking. Um, and then they put it in, right? So it's, it just gives you an example of, you know, oh, we've got a problem. That gray curve there is financial intermediation. It's completely outpacing the rest of the economy. 
must be valuable. It, you know, it's, it's earning all this money. Look at the U.S. financial corporate profits as a share of, um, of domestic total profits. So sorry, financial corporate profits. So that the relative size of finance also in terms of income was increasing. Um, let's give it a name, gave it a name, put it into GDP without any sort of value judgment of that kind of Smith, you know, buffoons, players, uh, opera singers type. Um, issues around corporate governance, Peter talked about shareholder value. Similarly, you know, this obsession with maximization of shareholder value, which many people have uh, tackled, um, it's quite interesting that if anything, it's getting worse. So many companies like Apple actually under Steve Jobs did no share buybacks. Under Tim Cook, that seems to be you know part of his big uh, plan, and this idea that you know shareholder value, just focusing on that is a problem for long run growth because you're basically just focusing on you know boosting your um, your ac your ac how do you say current uh, share prices and not actually making those investments which are much more difficult, uncertain, including R and D. This is going to be a problem. Now this is again getting worse, and the reason I think it's getting worse, and this is some data here from Bill Lazonic, who's done some great work on this. This actually came from a Harvard Business Review piece he did, which won a big prize, and he you know, actually put all the data showing that in so many companies, in, in many companies, the Fortune 500 companies, not only did the total of their spending on share buybacks, actually recently this went to three trillion, so three trillion in share buybacks in the last decade, sorry, three trillion in share buybacks in the last decades were spent by Fortune 500 companies. In many cases, Cisco, Pfizer, more than 100% of their net earnings are being spent on a combination of share buybacks and dividends. What's interesting is that the underlying theory of value, which you know underlies shareholder value, uh, maximization actually is also a, uh, uh, completely dismissive of this kind of focus on who actually created what, who is valuable. Because in fact, if you read Michael Jensen's work from the 1980s, Harvard uh, Business School, his notion was that the reason why maximizing shareholder value is right is that shareholders are the biggest risk takers. And risk taking, we all know, is really important, right? So feudalism, 500 years of inertia, uh, no risk taking, capitalism, lots of risk taking, innovation, again, we are in probably the heart of risk taking in the world here. And shareholders are seen to be the residual claimants. In other words, everyone else gets a guaranteed rate of return, right? So workers get their salaries, banks will get the interest rate that they're charging. If there's anything left over, if there's a residual at the end, that's what the shareholder gets. So they must be, you know, incredibly important. They're very important risk takers. They're very important value creators in capitalism being a system where we really value that kind of risk taking. Um, completely dismissing the fact that it's, you know, and this was what my previous book was about, the entrepreneurial state, and Fred Block's in the room here, and he's written great work with Matthew Keller, the state of innovation, um, on this as well, um, where, you know, the state has a guaranteed rate of return. I don't think so. You know, for every internet, there's been lots of failures. Internet, of course, was state funded. Everything in your smart products was state funded. Uh, GPS, internet, Siri, touch screen display. For all those successes, there was, there was also failures. Tesla received uh, almost as much money as Solyndra, $465 million in a guaranteed loan. For every Tesla, there will inevitably be quite a few Solyndras, right? So there's no guaranteed rate of return. And so only by unpicking those assumptions that underlie that approach to thinking about corporate governance, can we start having change? It's not enough just to say that this leads to short-termism or that this is unfair. Um, and in fact, what you then see, because it is continued to go out of hand, is the percentage of cash flows returned to shareholders continues to rise. The CEO to worker compensation ratio in the US is currently actually at record levels. This is, sorry, this isn't updated. So the profit wage ratio is at record levels. This is actually something Piketty, I think, could have spent more time on. Um, and business investment as a percentage of US GDP um, has been falling, right? So the reinvestment, what I was talking about before in terms of creative destruction, you know, machines here taking uh, some labor, but then those profits are being reinvested in other parts of the economy for the last 200 years, that has actually stopped. This extreme financialization um, is very much down to this, if you want, um, you know, financialized type of corporate governance. Um, and by the way, financialization, this word I've said now quite a few times, has two phases. One is, um, you know, finance, that first graph I had in the beginning here, uh, finance basically completely outpacing the rest of the economy. Why? Because it's kind of financing itself. It's financing fire, finance, insurance, and real estate. That's a huge problem in terms of no longer actually financing real things in the economy. Also, the short-term nature of the financial sector. This isn't true of all of finance, of course, but this is um, 
anyway, I'm, I'm not the first to say this. This is also one of the big causes of financial crisis. Um, but, um, uh, and the other phase of financialization is when industry itself becomes financialized in terms of this lack of reinvestment. Okay, other example, uh, big pharma pricing. This is probably the most explicit example. So the other one I just mentioned was when you have a complete lack of association between how we think about value and what's actually happening in production. So shareholders, yes, being important, but not the most important, not being the biggest risk taker, lots of other actors in the economy producing that value. This notion of value-based pricing is very interesting because up until recently, uh, the pharmaceutical companies, when they would increase by 300 or 1,000 percent often the prices of drugs, the excuse was we have to recoup our R&D costs. Um, when it was found that by all sorts of people, including myself and uh, Fred, that in fact something like 75 percent of the really uncertain part of the R&D cost was actually being borne by the public sector through agencies like the National Institutes of Health that every year spend over 30 billion on the high risk early stage research that actually leads to these pharmaceutical products, they had to come up with another theory. And they wonderfully came up with this theory here, which really, it's, it's the best kind of example of what I'm talking about, which is that, um, that uh, prices are basically in the eyes of the beholder. You should charge, as the head of Nostrum uh, argued the other day, the highest price that you possibly can in order to please your shareholders. But what is this theory? It's basically the price, uh, this the va value-based pricing is basically how much you value not having that drug, right? So what is the value to you of not having the drug, which if, you're, if your you know, son or daughter is sick, that you know, the value, of course, is infinity. Um, so should you price it to infinity? Of course not. Um, and this is why also Goldman Sachs, and I love when they talk so, op you know, how do you say, honestly, uh, <laughs> argued, in fact, curing patients is probably really stupid, isn't it? Because in fact, how money is made in this industry is by being able to charge these extremely high prices, which doesn't mean that pharmaceutical companies aren't actually creating value, of course they are, but a complete disproportion between the prices charged and, um, and what they're actually doing. Uh, platform capitalism is quite interesting. I mean, Peter already mentioned it, and I think we're gonna be talking about it quite a bit in the discussion, but when the tools, the technologies that are actually used to retrieve the data, think of GPS and the internet, are publicly financed, the data itself is part of citizens. Um, if we don't actually have an understanding of, of value as being collectively created through different types of time and effort of different parts of the economy, think of my first point there, markets or outcomes of the interactions between different types of actors. If we overly mythologize the role of the big uh, tech uh, companies, then at best what we have is the government coming in later and worrying about things like privacy or, oh, how much should we tax them or how should we regulate the industry versus actually having some sort of strategy where this area is actively co-created and co-shaped together with the different actors. And you could actually argue, as different people have, I have here a quote by Evgeny Morozov, who's been quite bold in this area, that you could actually perhaps think of reversing the logic where instead of having the current situation where the data is held in the companies and then we worry about things like GDPR afterwards, why not actually have, and this is a big question mark I have and perhaps we can talk about it, the data itself that has again been pub, you know, extracted using public technology from people actually be housed in some sort of public repository, have some sort of external counsel advisory board with really smart people like you guys, uh, no, but also, pub, you know, as we would treat different areas like human rights where you do have public bodies, um, advisory councils with different types of people, um, thinking about the kinds of conditions that should actually be in place in order for companies to use particular types of data, but also fees, why not? Um, whoops. The opposite case with uh, government, where we don't mythologize government as we do tech at all. In fact, what's really incredible is that because so many of government's services are in fact free, and so it's not easy to price that into GDP, the only thing that goes into GDP is the costs, right? So the salaries of the teachers goes into GDP, the cost of the teachers, um, but not the value that's actually produced. So it's actually impossible to do what Lord, not Lord, sorry, God, not Lord Blankfein, uh, Lloyd Blankfein did, which was to say that, you know, Goldman Sachs workers are the most productive in the world for civil servants. You can't, because we can't actually measure their productivity in terms of, because we don't have really, you know, proper measures of the value that they're creating because it's not priced. But more generally, what we also have is a huge 
not just ideology, but we have particular theoretical frameworks in economics like public choice theory, which have basically convinced many people that government failures are even worse than market failures. So I would argue market failure theory in economics is problematic because you always expect government to come in and fix things when they you know, mess up. So the financial crisis was a big problem, but there's all sorts of little problems, so we don't have enough spending and research, so government has to come in and fix that public good problem. Uh, firms are, are spending too much in areas that pollute, so government has to come in and fix the negative externality problem. SMEs maybe don't get enough finance, you've got to fix the asymmetric information problem. And so I, I often argue that that's a very problematic way to think about what government does. You wouldn't have gotten against Silicon Valley if government was just fixing little bits of that system. It actively co-created it. But what you then got was the other extreme that said government failure, corruption, capture is even worse than, than a market failure. So if you are going to do something government, do little. Just you know, occupy as, as less space as you can uh, and don't pick winners, don't crowd out, et cetera, which also leads to hemorrhaging of top talent actually in the civil service because you know, really smart people want to work in government if they can actually make change. That's why Steve Chu, Nobel Prize winning physicist, recently was running the DOE. He was actually given a huge remit from Obama to direct the 800 billion stimulus program. That was a rare sort of moment of boldness in recent years in the uh, US government, but surely the moonshot kind of you know, programs also attracted great people into government. As soon as you start telling government, oh, be careful, you know, you're just there to facilitate, de-risk, and enable uh, a business, you know, it also affects who wants to go into government, but also affects what government can do, and whether it even thinks it should have the capacities and capabilities, you know, strategic management, decision sciences, organizational behavior, all these great things that managers learn in business schools. Should civil servants also be studying those? Of course not, they're not creating value, they should just worry about rules of the game leveling the playing field, regulation. So they don't even invest in their own knowledge, right? So you get a self-fulfilling prophecy. Anyway, so this is the other extreme, that we don't know how to value government because of this price problem. Um, and that is just about, again, how we put it into GDP, but also because we don't have an actual understanding of the objective and conditions under which government has, has been so important, we actually haven't theorized how it has co-created the value. It hasn't just redistributed the value, or fix some sort of market failure. And so you get this kind of constant, sorry, I had to make this for a TED talk I gave years ago, but it took so long. I have to, you know, just to <laughs> justify the time that it took, put it up on anything I do. But you'd have to see the whole TED talk to understand what all these different things are. Uh, it was a proper TED, you know, the one that Chris Anderson does and stressed me out so much by saying, are you ready, are you ready, are you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> anyway, so, you know, this kind of assumption, this self-fulfilling prophecy, all the, you know, cool guys are here, even though I must say Kafka is better looking than Zuckerberg, but anyway, you know, and these guys here are just moving papers around. That actually ends up creating that system. Last slide, what to do, okay? And again, I'm sure that the discussion will focus on this quite a bit. Well, the first, the reason I um, didn't put forward my own theory of value in the book is what the real objective in the book was, was to argue that we have to bring value back to the heart of how we reason in economics. We don't even use the word anymore. Right? It's not in the textbooks. It's just Econ 101. It's actually gone to business schools. In business schools, you learn about value all the time. Again, shareholder value, value chains, shared value, all sorts of different ways that we talk about it. But it's really kind of fuzzy and flimsy. And that has itself made it really easy for the word to then be used in this very loose way. And again, then be used also to lobby for quite regressive policies. It was actually the VC community. Um, that lobbied for one of the most regressive uh, policies ever, which was the reduction of capital gains tax by almost 50% in four years at the end of the 1970s. It was the first thing that the National Venture Capital Association sort of thought to do in government, which you know, was not very also honest, because what we know VCs have done historically was actually follow very ambitious and, and uh, courageous uh, pots of government money. Uh, so in biotech, they came in 20 years after the NIH. Uh, laid out the groundwork, they don't actually look at capital gains. That just increases profits. But profits are, again, as I mentioned, at record levels today. And in fact, you needed Warren Buffett, who's not a communist, to say, can you please stop? <laughs> stop reducing my capital gains tax. I don't even look at it. I invest when I see an opportunity. And these opportunities have actually been collectively produced. Value has been collectively produced. But when you no longer have a focus on production and how it's changing and just allow prices to reveal value, it becomes really hard to theorize about that. So, you know, these stakeholder types of capitalism in Northern Europe, 
you know, one thing is just to say they have stakeholder governance, they have trade union on, you know, on the board. Another thing is actually to have a proper framework within economic theory that is able to also theorize about values collectively produced. Markets can, in fact, be shaped and co-created. We can actually move things from being unproductive to productive. That's why I don't like makers and takers. I like making and taking. Why not have a serious reform of finance, which we didn't do? That's why we're in a mess today. I hate to tell you, but we're <laughs> the, the, the source of the crisis was private debt, not public debt. And the ratio of private debt to disposable income today is back at record levels. You know, Wages have not increased, so people have to still take out credit in order to retain their living standards. We did not reform finance. We still have lots of speculative finance. We don't have patient, long-term committed finance, except in some rare uh, parts of the world. China, by the way, has learned the lessons in Silicon Valley. You know, uh, uh, we, we often in our community say that uh, the US talks Jefferson but acts Hamilton. Well, China is acting and talking Hamilton and is actually setting up those kinds of state institutions that actually back Silicon Valley from the DARPA, NIH, SBIR, NSF. China's massively investing in those. Trump, by the way, is the first US president ever. He's very unique, Trump. You, maybe you don't know that, um, to try to really attack these institutions. So the first thing he did in his first week in office was go after ARPA-E, the sister organization of DARPA and the Department of Energy, which is really smart if you want to destroy the state. You don't just cut the budget. Budgets come and go. Destroy the, the institutions, they can take 50 years to come back. Anyway, so we can steer activities in the production boundaries. We can reform finance to nurture what Minsky called the capital development of the economy. We can definancialize the real economy. We used to do this, by the way. Where do you think Bell Labs came from? Everyone knows oops, about Bell Labs, hopefully, here in, uh, in San Francisco. Very important R&D laboratory inside AT&T. It actually came from a time when government was actually quite uh, confident about its role in the economy. And in order for AT&T to retain its government-granted monopoly, it had to reinvest its profits back in the economy into big innovation beyond just telecoms. And their answer was Bell Labs. So conditions attached to all these different types of government investments in, instead of just sort of a giveaway. Um, we could also actually reform the way we do IPR, patent system. Currently, it's very problematic. We're patenting increasingly upstream. The tools for research are being patented. Um, patents are very wide. There could be different conditions on the, you know, what can be patented given precisely uh, the fact that lots of this uh, research was also publicly financed. So the public return has to be that once the patent is up, it's fully diffused. That's the whole point of actually uh, you know, writing things down as opposed to the Middle Ages where it was all about secrecy. But if in the meantime you patented so upstream that the tools are patented, you've actually blocked science. Um, anyway, so those could be different ways to put conditions. Delinking drug prices from perceived value. There are all sorts of areas that you could say, you know, like you could use prizes uh, to, to uh, you know, fund research in different types of drugs as opposed to expecting pharmaceutical companies to um, recoup their uh, investments through prices, even though, as I mentioned before, even that uh, approach is problematic because many of those investments weren't even coming from the businesses. Um, and we could actually have ambitious public policy to really very explicitly co-create value through public purpose. This is why I've set up this institute around public purpose. We could actually have moonshots, you know, just like going to the moon and back again was great, bold thing. Why not actually have, uh, you know, bold moonshot kind of... Uh, uh, um, attempts in areas basically to tackle the SDGs, so health, energy, and equality, but transforming these broad challenges into concrete missions. Why? Because that would be a way to actually very explicitly admit that the role of public policy is to co-create. And then, of course, you would welcome lots of bottom-up experimentation through the different tools, as we already have grants and loans, etc. cetera. Uh, you couldn't do this top-down, but these would also be, way, you know, also a way if you want to put conditions in place for these massive amounts of public investments, but to actually tackle societal goals. Um, and again, this is why I've sort of, I'm using a lot of my time to build actually this department. One of the things that we're actually trying to do is to set up an MPA, a master's in public administration, which gets civil servants to rethink the kind of things they've learned in public choice theory in terms of what their role in the economy is, and the last chapter in the book basically just argued that, you know, by really understanding value as collectively produced and by bringing value also back to the heart of how we talk 
um, so that value is contested, it's debated. It's not about saying this is the theory of value, this is correct, that was wrong, but making it much harder for these self-proclamations that that will be much easier than to drive the economy towards the kind of uh, areas that hopefully we all want, which is more inclusion, more sustainability, more innovation-driven uh, growth and less uh, extraction. That's it. <laughs> Are we sitting here? Wow, a fire hose of information, let's just say that. I went over, And Ned, sorry. much food for thought, um, and for the conversation. A lot of fodder for our conversation here. So as we pull these up, let's, uh, let's roll the conversation now with a couple questions from me, and it's going to really engage the folks here. And what I think, what we did with this, what you did with this was marvelous. Mm -hmm given us background on the whole foundation of economics, all these different eras, kind of an overview of all the different ways you could go. We thought for this conversation, we wanted to kind of also root it in, in something that's really dear, near and dear to the hearts of a lot of folks here. And that's to really start thinking about one other solution which wasn't in there is, you know, how, would, how could we use this idea of the era of big data and the value of data as a beginning point or at least one beginning point, to kind of use this to start to shift people's thinking about the fundamentals of the value of the economy and to start rethinking more creative ways to really work with that value. Mm -hmm. And this is something, um, she's done a couple of interesting articles. Uh, in fact, she did one on the MIT um, Technology Review um, in which she started to rough this out. It's one that one of the things that I, st I was reading that was really piqued my interest. and. Um, Maybe, do you want to, uh, first of all, when people think of data, they think of it, some people talk about, oh, it's the new oil, it's, it's a really, mm -hmm. it's, it's super, there's so much value in this now, it's, it's, it's where we're going to extract a lot of value in the future. I mean, do you share the idea that there's some kind of new core, uh, a place of value that we could actually start to leverage that to start to transform other parts of the economy? I mean, is this a good place to start if we're going to start thinking about reworking the economy, to start thinking mm -hmm. how do we, with fresh eyes and new approaches, really deal with who owns data, how do we pull the value from it, and um, how do we start to rework things? Is yeah, that fair but enough to I, say? But yes, but I would start with a more ambitious kind of issue, which is, you know, what do we, what are we interested, you know, why are we interested in big data? Data? Do you say data or data? Why am I saying data? I say data. What? Yeah, oh, so he's the yeah. weird one. Oh, I thought, like, that tomato, that. tomato. I was like, oh, my God, is this the English thing? Okay, um, okay. <laughs> so it's data. Okay, we'll go with data um, for you. How do you say patent? Do you say patent or patent? Patent. Patent, I say patent. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> my wife anyway. is British. We have this problem all the time. Um, um. So, I mean, I even see it with green, right? So innovation has not just a rate but a direction, right? So I think these questions are about directionality. And it's not just that, you know, what can you do with a hammer? You can both build a house and kill someone. What can you do with big data? You can do all sorts of harm, but you could also do all sorts of good. But these, these directions in the past have actually been actively shaped. And I'm always struck how in England, for example, in the UK, but I think this is actually in the world, so big data, data, has been massively used for some areas, like personalized medicine has, you know, really benefited from the data revolution. Whereas other things haven't at all, but not because they're not amenable to it, but because we just haven't wanted to, right? So social housing in the UK, we recently had something incredibly condescending, even though I must say that after spending a day in San Francisco, I'm shocked <laughs> by your problems, you know? And I'm, I, I have American citizenship, so don't take this too terribly, but I think it's shameful the level of poverty that I see in the streets here. There's no other word for it. I mean, I, I, I was crying this morning. It is. You know, there's homelessness everywhere, but I've never seen it to the, to the you know, extreme that I've seen here. Um, anyway, and the level of sickness, you know, the, how many sick people in the streets. Um, but social housing, which is a, you know, huge issue in terms of how best to structure basically the welfare state, in the UK, they just had something called the bedroom tax. And it was this, you know, long, drawn-out process where politicians thought about it, but it basically came down to the simplest, you can't even say the word algorithm, you know, how many bedrooms do you have? How many kids do you have? If one number is bigger than the other one, you're out. Yeah, so you leave 
a social housing in a state, that's what do you call them, a projects here, mm -hmm. that you might have lived in for a long time, your kids are in school, but because they wanted to you know, implement austerity, they also started to cut budgets around social housing, and they implemented this incredibly simplistic, I mean, it, it's like a barbaric kind of rule in terms of you know, all the thought that went into it, which was basically zero, when the data that they had on those people was huge. You know, we know there's very little data on rich people, right? The Panama Papers thing, we realize just how much secrecy. There's so much information on low-income people because to get into those houses, they had to, you know, fill out all these forms, you know, often what schools their kids go to, if, if a child is autistic, if, you know, all sorts of things about the family. None of that was used to make these choices. So, you know, just to give an example, so much, and then you have increasing returns, right? When you do start applying big data, questions to a particular area, then that takes off, just in the same way that when, you know, uh, with the engines that we have in our cars, initially there was different choices. Um, and almost by historical accident, the internal combustion engine got a bit of a head start, and it actually became the best, just because innovation is subject to these very strong increasing returns. Um, same thing with the QWERTY keyboard, you know, that we're all using. It's definitely not the best one, but just because it got for historical accident, because people were typing so fast the keyboards were jamming, they decided that that was the better keyboard to have, so people would type slower. Makes no sense to have it today, but again, increasing returns. We all learned that one. For God's sakes, do not change it, right? So... Um, well, so we're early enough in the big data we're world early that we enough. could actually search Well, we could actually, but where does that come from? It definitely doesn't come just from the tech community saying, oh, this, you know, it comes from an actively, col well, a collective understanding. Again, what kind of society do we want to live in? And I mentioned green before. Um, what's really interesting that Germany has done recently in order to have a massive green transition of their country is they really use the word green to mean direction. So the Energiewende, mission, you know, I was talking about missions at the end, is about a massive green transformation of the whole country. So even steel, and you don't think of steel when you think of an, an energy transition, right, has lowered its material content a lot, but because it was guided to, they had to, everyone had to change. But how they changed, you know, everyone was allowed to do how they wanted. It wasn't sort of a top-down kind of Soviet planning kind of system. But they had that idea that we want to, just like China, $1.7 trillion they're spending today in you know, changing how production, consumption, and distribution are done in a green direction. That requires a plan. And so I think what we don't have today with big data and AI, we have an assumption that somehow you know, this is all just good, it's driving the future of innovation, forgetting also that lots of the technology, again, has come from the public sector, but I don't want to always come up with that because it sounds like it's the only thing I'm saying. But, <laughs> you know, what, how do we want to shape this thing? And if we keep thinking of regulation as something that comes in post facto, um, it's going to be really hard. Fracking, by the way, I, I don't know if I mentioned, was also publicly financed, and we were just worried about fracking afterwards. The whole point of saying that actually, you know, the state has been transformational is not to say the state is good. The state does a lot of stupid things as well. But as soon as you admit that the state can be transformational, not just fixing things on the sides, we better have a serious debate in society. What are we financing? How are we financing it? How can we shape things in a particular way? And I think we're living in an era where we no longer kind of do that. And so big data presents us a challenge of, what is it for and how can we actively co-create this space so we don't need regulation to come in later, always catching up out of breath. <gasps> we have to, you know, well, tax so, this or... Well, so, and we're going to get to uh, open it up here in a second here, but, but so let's, let's think about that for a second. So you've got Europe's all freaking out about privacy and data. I'm not freaking out. Why are you saying freaking out? Well, I mean, well, the US too. <laughs> I mean, uh, well, I'm just saying, both, we, we have a moment here where yeah. we could actually do something yeah. transformative. Mm -hmm whether it's the European initiatives or whether it's the United States now starting to wrap their heads around this. How could we do it differently? I mean, you, 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 to just talk through just one idea there, and I'd love to open it up to other folks too if they, if they can think about this, but like, could we actually say that data is, you, you talked about it as a public good, that it wouldn't be owned by the company? It could be a public good. It could it be. It could be, because mm -hmm. they talk about how would a system work where then the company, if they wanted to use that data, would it simply have to pay for use of that data to actually That would be very static, right? I mean, that would also assume that we even know what the data, I mean, so much, so, so, so many uses and ways that we are extracting data today were maybe unforeseeable yesterday, right? So you'd, you'd, you'd have to have a very flexible system, but you know, we can, when we put our minds to things that we care about, we do construct institutions. 
that are really complex. I mean, the welfare state, for God's sakes, was really complex. It was an institution. It wasn't just this thing that happened one day to the next, right? We have set up extreme, you know, United Nations, very complex institution. Why can't we set up some institutions that are creative? They're, they shouldn't be static. It shouldn't be impeding innovation. This whole notion that anytime you have regulation or some sort of governance of a system, it's going to impede innovation. Again, the whole point of what was reminding people how much government has done for innovation is to say, let's just get over that, right? We know that's ideology. Let's be adults in the room. How can we actually structure perhaps institutional and social innovations that would allow that relationship to, I don't want to say reverse, because then it does sound like the companies are always there just kind of having to pay or, or to sign some sort of document of conditions. But again, I mean, just put blankly, the, you know, people's data is incredibly important to their future reputations, to their ability to get jobs, to their, again, privacy. This is obviously so important, like human rights. There's, you know, it, I would treat it almost as a human right and give it as much seriousness as we give human rights in terms of having to think about what is the right type of governance structure, but set up that governance structure so it's driven you know, by the kind of innovative energy that the DARPAs have, which are also you know, governed by all sorts of planning mechanisms and not stifling innovation. I don't know. I mean, I really would love to open it to the floor to have people think about how might we do this? Let's put our minds to it. Instead of this, you know, juxtaposition, my little TED Talk thing there, you know, all oh, this innovation is going to get stifled by, you know, Margaret Vestager, who I, I love. <laughs> She's really, I think, the hero today of being well, able is to... There, is there anyone else? Okay, so, so let's, here's a guy right here. I mean, well, let's run a... F there's a couple of hands going up here. What we're going to do is um, make sure the mic, as, we, as is our way, just stand up and, and introduce you. I know it's right here, this guy in the support coat here. Um, just stand up and introduce yourself and, and say, and again, it doesn't have to be exactly on this topic, but if you have something oh, to contribute to this, do this. <laughs> and uh, let's, let's open this up to you folks now. Good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Stephen Hill. I'm a journalist uh, writing about tech. Um, why not, in terms of what we do about data, why not create a kind of CERN for yes, AI exactly. development mm -hmm. in which the data, I, I mean, the Evgeny Morozov uh, quote, I think, is really applicable here that even if we try to monetize and put ourselves in control of our own personal data, we will have no leverage, no bargaining power vis-a-vis yeah, -vis the companies that are taking our data because we're too, yeah. we're too much of what's sometimes called a distributed workforce or distributed audience today. We can't organize in that way. So if instead the data was something that we held in common and then we had something like, uh, does anyone know what CERN is? It does high intensity yeah. physics, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, or some sort of multinational collaborative. I mean, right now, data is not just what happens to us individually, but it's also becoming part of economic nationalism. China has its data. Mm -hmm. the United States has its data. Europe is trying to figure out how to get data. I, I mean, we had this beautiful dream of an open internet, and that dream is dead. Uh, the internet is, is becoming nationalized at this point. We're going back to that. And so it, it's a matter of recognizing that and yeah. figuring out what kind of things do we need to have. Is it a CERN for AI? Uh, digital licenses for companies. I mean, if you think about a, a company, uh, if, if Ford wants to go to Germany and set up a plant, it can't just plop down in the middle and start doing whatever the heck it wants. It has to apply for permits and licenses and all these sorts of things. It sets up the rules and regulations for what this company can do in Germany. When Volkswagen came here and got caught in emissions scandals because they violated their permits and their licenses and the laws. Well, with uh, these internet companies that sort of exist everywhere and nowhere, they're, they're adhering to no permits or licenses anywhere. So we can come up with digital licenses and permits that companies must adhere to, depending on where they're operating. I mean, there's, in some ways, this solution to me is, uh, it's, it, we, we've, we've gotten used to, you talk about the stories, we've gotten used to thinking that these internet companies are somehow different. And so we have to treat them differently. No, in some ways, we have to treat them like we've always treated traditional brick and mortar companies, applying the same rules, the same laws. You don't have Uber and taxi companies that are giving the same service with two different sets of rules and laws. It makes no sense. Yeah. So I think we apply the same rules, the same laws, CERN for AI. I think there's a lot of good ideas that we can come up with for doing totally, this sort of thing. Totally. 
Did you want to jump in? Because so there's other people here. So we are too. actually writing an article on exactly that, and it was called CERN for AI. So I'll, I'll send it to you. Really? <laughs> I wrote an article about this for Bertelsmann Stiftung. Oh, I, I find okay. that Germany and Europe are much further ahead in thinking yeah. about these things than we are here in the United States. And yeah. So but we you can know exchange what's articles. Yeah. No, no, that it's fantastic. And I really like how you, uh, I'd, I'd love to read what you've written about it. But you know, what's interesting also with these companies is they're called tech companies, but many of them, at least the ones that you know you were probably thinking about, are actually media companies. And we're, we're not regulating them as media companies. So even just, you know, it's not so much the brick and mortar, how they've defined themselves. Um, and just, just really quickly, okay. in terms of rules, it's amazing how the companies themselves are setting rules all the time, right? They have actually set rules that determine who we can interact with, who we can know, all, you know, all sorts of rules that govern how we interact in the system. But that's not seen as kind of rules and regulations, right? They're kind of seen as just being very creative. And then as soon as the governments are trying to set some rules and regulations for these companies, oh, that's going to cause all sorts of, uh, of you know, impediment to innovation. But the question is, what kind of rules and why? We got a lot of, yeah. a lot of people want to say something to say here. But so let's, uh, let's go here I'm quick. Amit Pradhan. I'm uh, chairman of an AI company and president of Silicon Valley Blockchain Society. So mm. You can see where I'm going with this. Um, so I think the, uh, we, we have a conversation about, about data in, in, in a very abstract form. Um, and in reality, you, know, you can actually think about data as, I like to call it the AI of you and the AI of us, mm. right? And, and that's where kind of that line between personal data and personal data that goes and adds value to when you think about it from a healthcare perspective. And, and we, 95% of the, of the world doesn't live in the bubbles that we live in. They don't understand data in the way that we do. So when we think about the monetization of it, um, in reality, if we start thinking about just giving people agency over that data, mm. and, and now we can use things like the blockchain to keep a track of what value is being generated from that data as it transitions to the AI of us as it starts aggregating value, whether it goes through large companies, I call them the GAFA bat, you know, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. Um, but regardless of that, you know, as it transitions through, we now have an ability to track its value. And so when we think about, like, should companies just pay people for using data and kind of flatten that fee and everyone pays 10 cents, it doesn't make sense. But from a capitalist viewpoint, as that data aggregates value, we can start driving value back to that AI of us because it contributed to the AI of you. And there's a lot of interesting models to do that. There's a lot of interesting platforms and technology to do that. We're working on some of that stuff. Very interested in companies that are, are working towards that model. And eventually getting to a point where I think when we talk about UBI, right, you lose half the audience because it sounds like you're giving free money to someone. Right. I refer to it more as UEI. It's the universal earned income, mm. right? There is incredible unlocked value in our digital existence, mm. right? And mm. if we can earn financial value based upon how much we choose to participate, then that regular income coming to us is an earned income. And we kind of step away from losing the narrative battle because the storytelling at the end of the day is what wins the, wins the game. Mm -hmm. So it's some of the stuff that we're working on. Thank you. Some wonderful Thanks. ideas here. Can, can I ask you a question just quickly about that? Yeah. So do you think when you say, um, so are, are you thinking that individuals would be earning or would you see it more as a community kind of fund? Because it, it, it could also actually pit people against each other, right? Also those less able to access, um, you know, the digital world, et cetera. Whereas if you think of it as also, you know, this collectively created infrastructure, right? So then you want to actually make sure that there's some communal or collective ways to recoup those profits, which then can be decided what to do with them in terms of benefiting the social good. But it sounds like you're thinking that literally as you click, something goes into your bank account. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's both, right? Because value is always aggregated. Mm -hmm. um, so people participate, if you just, take the example of a dev the devices we use today. They're multi-sensory inputs, right? So it's not just what we click, it's the way I see it is it's uh, explicit, you know? So I might say to my phone, get me directions to this location, you know, and invite these four people to join me. And in its raw form, 
that data has very little value, right? It has privacy issues because yeah. that's being captured and sent out into somebody's cloud, right? And we, we tend to be, either we think big companies are bad or we're naive and we think it's in safe hands. And, and it's neither, right? They're just commercial actors, right? Even Cambridge Analytica was a commercial act that went wrong, right? Um, but the, so I think that the, the, the reality is that we have multi-sensory inputs. Mm -hmm. So there's also implicit things happening. The fact that you know, I'm here and my device knows this is my, my geographical location. And then there's cognitive data events. The fact that I'm here for the third time is starting to, to establish a pattern that it happens once every month. And this event happens once every month. Does right? it? Oh, so it's not special that I'm here? <laughs> <laughs> Never <laughs> as good as this. <laughs> no, 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 no. no, no. No, and, it's and great. I'm glad you're coming in three months, three times. Um, and, so, and so therein lies the, you know, that, that, the, the, the value, yeah. right? So it can be collective, but mm -hmm. certainly individually as well. Okay, there's, uh, can I see hands of people who want to chat? Because there's a lot of interesting uh, hands here. But we got Mike, Michael over here. Do you want to sure. uh, introduce yourself? Yep, uh, Michael McElligot with the Long Now Foundation. Um, so, uh, so historically with products and markets, there's consolidation uh, from a lot of car companies, from a yeah. lot of hardware makers, down to two, usually one big winner and one secondary winner. Um, and that's the way it tends to go. Um, so looking at the US technology conglomerates, um, there's this interesting trend where Google, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft are getting in each other's product lines uh, for the last five or 10 years, whether that's making phones, creating content, media, um, uh, cloud computing. And so it, it, it seems like they're shaping up to these super technology providers um, with the effect, I think, today that as consumers and users, we get a benefit of a bounty of competition, of innovation, because they're highly charged against each other. But um, what I increasingly feel like is there should be a trend towards consolidation uh, that could ultimately lead to a bait and switch, a squeezing of the consumer in what is currently affordable or even free, um, you know, that in the future, as that competition consolidates down to a couple winners, when you're not trying to beat the price of the other guy, but now there's, you know, a Google soft or, or whatever uh, happens uh, that, you know, that, that, that kind of assumed contract that we have in the short term, uh, that this is going to be affordable, that I can see any website I want to, et cetera, especially um, with the, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, ability of ISPs to control content potentially coming up as well. So, so I just, kind of a question to you, what, what your thoughts are on these, uh, this consolidation of our entire digital worlds, including our personal data, but also our information, our access to the network, our access to all kinds of content sources. Um, do you have thoughts and concerns about um, where that goes? And Because it, it's not something I see being thought about a lot. We tend to think of, it's always gonna be like this. These four or five companies are gonna continue to compete, continue to innovate. But typically when, you know, when PowerPoint wins, they don't innovate on PowerPoint. Um, when the browser wars happened, as soon as Internet Explorer won, they stopped improving the browser. Um, if our entire digital world is hold, held by uh, one of those companies or a couple of those companies, innovation doesn't necessarily happen if it's only up to okay. the market. Yeah. So before I even started, oh, sorry, can I answer that? Yeah, no, go ahead. Okay. No, no, I'm um, just looking for I that. used to study that question in other sectors. So my PhD was actually looking at computers and automobiles um, in terms of these consolidation effects and actually shampoo too. So shampoo is the only industry that never actually consolidated. Um, <laughs> but almost every industry did exactly what you said, which is, and it's almost always after like 23 years, something happens in the 23rd year that you go from like, you know, 300 to 30, from 30 to three. <laughs> um, but what's really interesting is that antitrust policy then focused too much on the number, which the, the risk is you're sort of doing that or not, I'm not sure. But it's, it's never really been the number of companies that mattered, right? So if GM, Ford, and Chrysler were actually competing 
through innovation, then does it matter that there's three versus 200? There's plenty of industries where you might have 200. Think of shampoos, and it, it's not that innovative. Um, and so the real question is how are firms competing? Are they competing through marketing? Are they competing through fooling people? Are they actually competing through innovation? Think of um, Walmart and Costco are two great companies to think about because they're in the same exact sector, but they actually have completely different business models. Uh, you know, Walmart's business model is basically, you know, Marx's labor exploitation. Uh, <laughs> Costco is actually through innovation. They have, you know, similar uh, profit margins, but their, you know, uh, way of thinking about how to do that is very different. So Costco workers are unionized, et cetera. So the real question, I think, is what do we know in this fang bang bang area <laughs> of how the firms are competing? The and, so, and that then again comes down to the degree to which you know, lots of the sources of the profits are or are not based on, you know, advertising how much, you know, I mean, Google apparently when it bought Uber, uh, at least this is what the Uber drivers tell me, Uber's gone downhill because it's, the technology is not working that great. So is it true or not that when these big companies then are purchasing these uh, smaller guys, the small companies then actually suffer inside, perhaps also because of the financialization question. I think these are fundamentally big questions that are and sometimes not necessarily because of the consolidation question. It's more what's happening, how are they competing, how are they adding value. Um, and you know, if, if you look again at the Bell Labs question, that was a l very large company that actually remained quite functional. Cisco itself was quite functional up until a certain point. It was a very large company, but when it became ultra-financialized, very different. So when today companies are bought up by Pfizer or Cisco, their life is very different from being bought up, say, by Ericsson, which continues actually to innovate and to reinvest its profits. W one thing I'd just add to this, though, um, and again, it's there is a kind of a way of thinking of uh, these big companies as, as super resistant to change. And I kind of hinted at this in my intro, and I've my own consistent being around here for the last 25 years is I think there's a lot of openness to potentially system changes on more macro levels that these tech companies would be not just amenable to be going along with, but potentially could champion. Mm -hmm. now, this could be more too idealistic. But um, I do think that there's something in this community I would just like to keep throwing out there that um, it's not clear to me that the tech industry is like the oil industry was, mm -hmm. or the finance industry is in Wall Street, or whatever else. That there's a kind of a different thing going here. Now, maybe I might be wrong on that. But that it's a younger gener there's often younger generations. There's a generational change. There's a lot of leadership there. Um, there's um, it's a it's a relatively young industry. Uh, it's it's there's a lot of things that I just think we should take. Which at industry least is not young when it begins? Well, I guess when it begins. Yeah. Uh, but, but I'm saying compared to what we what we're mm -hmm. what the battles we're having with Wall Street or the oil industry right now. I don't necessarily mm -hmm. think you'd throw the tech industry into the same category I of, of somebody or look, the farm I mean, industry again. I, I've mentioned telecoms. If you look at how Huawei works, it's a cooperative, by the way. It's like John Lewis. I don't know if you know John Lewis in London, but it's a great store. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a cooperative. Ericsson is very different from Cisco. I mean, like, these are actually fundamentally in, you know, companies can, in a, a given sector, actually behave in very different ways. Mm -hmm. So that's actually something I don't know much about. I mean, the degree to which, and actually Google, I think, is, is quite um, interesting. They really do reinvest a lot of the profits. They totally. are incredibly innovative, even in energy. It's, it's not a coincidence that Google hired Arun Majumdar, who was the head of ARPA-E, um, to be the vice president of energy in Google. You know, Google, Google in some ways is, is I don't want to say Bell Labs, but I mean, but, but that's different, actually, from some of these other companies. They're actually very different from each other. These, the, what was the Fandang Bank? No. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and I just wonder if even, you know, it's, it's not just that, it's not tech, it's media, but actually within those, they're really, there's differences that actually matter a lot. And, you know, just saying Steve Jobs didn't do share buybacks, Tim Cook does, I mean, that's just like, again, I, I don't want to always bring it back to share buybacks, but it is, there's different ways to run these companies. There's different ways that they could be competing. There's different ways that they could be engaging with government. You know, just think of Peter Thiel. Yikes. And um, Elon Musk. And, you know, I mean, they talk about government in very different ways. So I think it'd be very interesting to think about what is the kind of conversation that we think should be happening between entrepreneurs, 
in the valley and governments that instead of asking for different type of favors, which will again increase profits even more, um, to really actively shape together with civil society organizations, right? It shouldn't just be tech and, and government, with, diff you know, with labor unions, bring them together in some sort of forum, not just an event, but again, in a CERN type <laughs> organization to think about the future of this industry. Um, and I think, again, the, these differences, I mean, even the PE ratios, by the way, I mean, you know, Amazon, you know, Jeff Bezos' wealth, if you bring that PE ratio down to what it should be, I mean, his wealth is not actually based on, you know, like people, I was just talking about this actually with Tim O'Reilly, he, he said it to me, he said that, you know, people wrongly think, oh God, Amazon, it's so rich and yet it doesn't pay its workers very well, but that's because what it's actually doing isn't actually earning Amazon all that much. This huge wealth that Bezos and Amazon have is actually based on speculation, the P.E. ratio. If you look at the cash Sorry? If you look at the cash holdings of Amazon yeah. Yeah. Can we get a so they're oh. very different from each other. How much they're actually earning from what they're doing versus from speculation. Why don't, why don't we just get you? Do you want to say it just so people can hear? Uh, just, well, can you introduce yourself? To, yeah. uh, I'm Quentin Hardy. I, I work for Google Cloud. And he used to be. I used well, he's, to be, he's still a great journalist, but used to be. Yeah, kind. Um, <coughs> for starts, yeah. I mean, one of the interesting things to do with the companies to look at their cash holdings and Amazon's. Yeah. Last time I looked, which was a couple of years ago, were significantly lower than a Google or a Microsoft. I have no idea what Huawei's got on hand or whether they disclosed. Um, but what I was going to try and get to was when we talk about data, a lot of questions arise. Like, first off, is data like blood types, where some is rarer and more valuable than others? Or is data like a screw, where it's not really about the data per se, it's what it's going into? So once we sort of talk about these things, we need to be talking about sort of interactions and outcomes yep. more than data per se. And we have to think of a way of getting to that if we're going to value this stuff appropriately. Because data yeah. on its own has a lot to do with the other data it's going to work with. It has a yep. lot to do with how it's organized and tagged. It's, you know, the, the real mm -hmm. value is in the, the ultimate interaction and the yep. pattern and the insight. So that has to be captured and valued somehow. Yeah. So gaming itself produces data. It's not like right. it's there it's to put data, it in. Data yeah. itself is... You got all kinds, and it's worth all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. It's really contextual now. It's not stated. Okay, we, yeah, we, we're going to jump here. No, we're getting towards the end here. And b by the way, folks, at the end of this conversation, we're going to have more drinks, food, interaction. Smoke, no? Marianne, <laughs> Marianne, <laughs> here. you're in California. Um, but anyhow, we can continue this conversation. But there's a, we, we, we do have a few more hands continued. here. And also, could I see the last couple, just one last show of hands of people who are allowed to get here? I'd like to get, um, okay. Fred, here. you should ask a question. <laughs> okay. And let's, let's go here, and then we'll go here. We, we haven't had a woman here. We're trying to get more female hands here. Let's get, but let's uh, start here. Hi, I'm David Grossup. I don't work with pharma companies. Okay. I Good. buy most of them, and I'll try to talk as fast as you and sort oh. of not seem like gonna a be troll. That's going to be hard. Um, so I like buy most of the analysis in the book, The Truth About the Drug Companies, Drug Companies Corrupt Medical Education, Medical Publishing, Politics. They buy politicians. They buy pricing power. They really corrupt the regulators. Nonetheless, I found myself um, very doubtful about what you were saying. There's no successful example of bounties really working. There's no successful model of um, blended multiple bottom line, uh, successful broad scale drug development institutionally. You know, which you might imagine that you could have a sort of B Corp type uh, management of pharma companies. Those don't exist yet. Right now, we have this sociopath model of drug companies, and they work for branded drugs and generics. And you mentioned a generic example, which is a regulatory failure uh -huh. as much as any other, because they, the regulators knocked out everybody but Nostrum as the alternative to the branded product. They had been losing money before. Maybe they were losing money because they had better manufacturer and they were a less efficient producer at higher quality that the market wasn't paying for. And now today, they get to cash in. So like, why is that bad and outrageous? And why is there a need for fundamental change? Unless you're interested in a more fundamental change in corporate governance. As for the idea that basic research produces some very, very significant chunk of the value chain in um, the branded drugs and the patents are somehow overly rent-seeking tools. The biggest risks are at the end of a very, very long product development time. The failure rate in phase two, phase three is still very high. It's hundreds of million dollars 
hundreds of million dollars bets to do clinical trials, and they usually fail. And it's very hard to predict or tune or optimize, improve and innovate. They have to have a boatload of money at the end. And I don't know how you design the pricing power unless you're going to have a great bounty system. But we don't have that yet. So what do you really want to do with drugs? Because I really don't buy the NIH thing. I think you need patents for specific asset investments to motivate those clinical trials. I'm defending the status quo and its rational core. Not all the corruption the drug companies implement on the institutional edges and, you know, but that core. What's wrong with it? Okay. The, ba the Bay Dole Act in 19, was it 80 or 1982? 1980, the reason they did it was because there was all this publicly funded research, which before 1980 couldn't be patented, and so they wanted to increase commercialization. The whole biotech boom was because of that act, right? It, it wasn't that there was more you know, great biotech thinking is that we all of a sudden could actually patent by, you know, publicly funded research. Uh, the uh, researchers in the, in, the, in, in the universities actually set up their startups through those patents. That could have worked fine. That could have actually done what the bio, what Beidol was supposed to do, which was to allow this great science, instead of to stay in the academies, to actually allow it to be, um, you know, create commercialization in the real economy. In the Beidol Act, it actually says that the prices of the drugs should actually be uh, accounting for that publicly funded research, right? They should have marching rights. The government should have marching rights. They've it's actually, they've never exercised it. That's the problem, that when you have the story that you just told, which, because no one in their right mind would say that the pharmaceutical companies produce no value. Of course they do, and you just gave the perfect example that those clinical trials do cost money. Of course they're doing it. But the drug prices, the level of drug prices, you think that, again, the value-based pricing model is the right model to account for what pharmaceutical companies actually did. They're basically working on that part of the innovation chain, which is much less uncertain, right? It simply isn't true that, you know, they are, again, the biggest risk takers, that they are taking on the extreme uncertainty. The NIH kinds of funds, and they're global funds, the MRC in the UK exists as well, is often taking the really high extreme risk in the early stage. It's not that they're the only players. The point is, if you don't then un, you know, think about that collective group of different actors, including Big Pharma, they do produce value, if you don't admit that there are other actors, then we end up with the pricing model which you know, is, is based on a myth. Um, and in fact, the value-based pricing model is kind of an extreme form of that myth because it's literally what the market will bear. Um, so that would be fine if you didn't have any public investments, A, and B, if these things were not essential. We're not talking about cars or, you know, luxury vehicles or jewelry. We're talking about an area which if you don't have it, you die. So why not treat it like the military? The military, when we want to fight a war, you know, they have very strong missions. They do bring in the private sector, but they bring them in through prizes, and then you get different types of private providers coming in to build a bomb or an innovation that the military needs to achieve a goal, right? You wouldn't want to do that for building cars, perhaps, but for really important areas, question mark, might we think about, sorry? Food. Food. I'm not talking about nationalization. See, this is the thing. It always goes back to socialism or capitalism. This is capitalism. We're only talking about capitalism. We're talking about capitalism, which has huge public involvement. So we're not talking about the free market. In Adam Smith, by the way, free market meant free from rent. It wasn't free from the state. And when you have a weak state, you have huge amounts of rent seeking. In fact, the pharmaceutical companies are massive rent seekers. So it's not about, do we want to nationalize the industries? Do we want to actually co-create this industry, which it already is. The state is already putting in all this money, but without actually a strategic view of what the hell it's doing, which it does have in the military. Surprise, surprise. And it's not that I want to make things like the military. I don't like war. But it's surprising that when you actually really care about something, like winning the war, you are not naive. All right. We, we can pick that up later. Let's, we have the last question here before we keep people from the drinks and more conversation. But go ahead. Okay. I'm Deborah Naki. I work in, I've worked for several big data companies in energy, uh, Internet of Things, and then in uh, weather insurance. And I'm in digital marketing. And I'm wondering if the value of data is asymptotic. The first time Peter goes to the Kardashians' in Instagram, it gives us a data point. The second time, it confirms he actually meant to go there. <laughs> the third and fourth time might be a buying signal. The fifth and sixth time becomes irrelevant. So right. I'm not that interesting. I spend X million 
thousands of dollars a, a year, X million over a lifetime, probably 80% of that is pretty predictable. You know, Eddie Bauer and Costco, it's not that interesting. <laughs> so where is the value in data beyond a certain level? I mean, the weather industry was interesting because they were bringing really different data sets together. But consumer data, you know, where, where does it peak? How do you actually monetize it? Uh, this is definitely for the people behind you. Well, it's kind you. of what you're saying, too. I mean, <laughs> it's similar to what Quentin was saying at some level. But, uh, it's a very good question. And again, well, ha and also, what is small data? Have, I mean, wh what is it? Ha did we ever have it? <laughs> All right. Then I'll tell you what we'll do is let's turn that back at everybody else. Have, how about everyone grab a drink? There's and some more food. Back. No, no, no. We're just and uh, hang out. Mariana will be here. But anyhow, thank you so much. And let's give a big hand to Mariana for stimulating us and thinking hard about very difficult to Thank you. Oh, and by the way, her book is available out there. Absolutely buy that book. It's an awesome book. And she's available here to sign that book as well. And uh, she'll be signing books out there. So go for it. Thank you. Small data is.